Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, who has it? Who wants to ask the question? Okay, from Cameroon. Is it the same brother Peter I was talking about? Shalom Church, Pastor, your teachings have set me free from doctrinal imprisonment. <laughs> he said, and due to your teachings, my eyes of understanding are now open. Thanks, Daddy. I wish to ask, what is the difference between heaven and paradise? And is heaven partitioned into realms? If yes, please help me with it, sir. And what does Second Corinthians 12 to imply? More grace, Daddy. The difference between heaven and paradise. According to the scripture, paradise is the waiting place, the resting place of the saints before we will come down here to rule for 1,000 years. Anyone that dies now, you are resting in paradise. Paradise is a place, it's a name given to the place of rest. Rest. But heaven, amen, heaven is a realm. They are, heaven is a name given to spiritual realms. The realms of glory. And why we call it realms is because Apostle Paul spoke about the third heaven. So if there is the third heaven, then there is the first heaven, there is the second heaven, and then there is the third one. So I believe some try to break it down to be you know and, and try to um, attach some physical things to it, but I believe they are all realms of glory. For God dwells God's dwelling place is also referred to as heaven. But this dwelling place of God, you know, wherever he show forth his glory, they are in realms. So it is the place of the various realms of the location of God's glory. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 2. Can we read it? He said, okay, it's the same place. I have quoted that already. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of body I cannot tell, God know it. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So I think I've explained that. Yes, the question. Church, praise the Lord. Let's see another one, Sister Grace from Kogi State. Shalom, sir. Please, I need a clarification. During this Muslim, <laughs> during this Muslim festival, assuming they give you food and meat, ram, as a Christian, should we eat it? Praise the Lord. I think I've answered that before. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. From verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols. This is what Apostle Paul say. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge perfect up but charity defy it. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lost many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it there is not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. 
but meat, food generally commended us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we, are, if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, finally, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stand unless I make my brother to offend. So, Apostle Paul is saying there is nothing wrong with it. The only thing wrong with it is if a brother believes it is wrong by his understanding. And such a brother, before God, he is weak as far as knowledge is concerned. So the only reason you will not eat before such people is because they are there. But Apostle Paul say, while they are there, don't eat. But if they are not there, what can we wear? Chop them. God bless you. Yes. Chop, sure, praise the Lord. Uh -huh. Sir, when I was reading this book by Raymond Jackson, he was talking about some of the beasts that appeared in Revelation chapter 12 from verse 1. Seven. Chapter 12 or chapter 13? 13. So chapter 13. Thank you. Romans 1 to 7. I wanted to know. I wanted to know the significance of those beasts and where they stand out and where and actually where they fulfill the scriptures in the world we are living today. I preached the sermon series on the book of Revelation. Please. Go and listen to it. If I start this one, we'll not go close. We'll not go pray today. There are two beasts there. Yes, sir. One out of the water. Correct? Yes, sir. Answer me. Yes, sir. The other one from the earth. Yes, sir. Now, by the description, by the description there, the one from the earth is America. Yes, sir. The one from the water. It's in Europe. It's in Rome. Yes, sir. They are the two beasts. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sabri, I want to ask, I want to confirm whether a woman can wear trousers in a working place. After working, then you move it and go back to her. Like, like we are working where? As in, in a working place. Like which type of work? In a hospital. Hospital. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Listen. We speak. The Bible says it is wrong for a woman to wear that which pertains to a man, and for a man to put on that which pertains to a woman. Now, why do they do that? It's for fashion. Why will you wear trousers in the hospital? If somebody in the military, a woman in the military, wears trousers by the nature of their job, or a woman mechanic, woman engineer, the nature of the job, she has to climb some places, you know, that's understandable. You know, that is not for fashion. But to wear trousers for fashion, God is against it. God bless you. Please, sir. They said it's a uh, uniform. Uniform in the hospital. Yes, sir. To wear, is it for in the theater, operation theater? It's just their uniform they use to put on. Nurses' uniform. Well, these are some of the things anywhere you walk and it offends any practice there offends your faith you resign you resign 
anywhere you walk and the place there the type of thing done there offends your faith resign is part of the price we pay for the stand we take god bless you but first first go there and tell them please I don't wear trousers. I can wear a long cloth, the same color with everybody, but not trousers. Well, uh, I've told them, they say it, it's just use and walk. Then you remove it when going out. That's what I'm saying. You see, when you are speaking from a conviction, it's different from if you are, wear, if you are not wearing trousers because pastors say your church doesn't wear trousers. It must be a personal revelation that you have. And when you do that, God has a way of backing it up when you want to stand for your conviction. But if you have no conviction, you wouldn't even know how to explain it to them. You see? Because I know a sister here that went for interview. She needed a job so badly. And the human resource manager, she said, what is it? What is this? What is it? Why, why are you dressed like this? Why are you dressed like this? Blah, 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 blah. You know, the sister first asked her, excuse me, is dressing part of this interview? You want to show you're a Christian? He said, I'm not showing you I'm a Christian now. This is how I like to appear. Simple. It's not about Christianity. This is how I like to appear. Simple. So, so this is what I'm saying. You have to be convinced. And then you can talk to them. Most of the time, you condemn them. That's why they fight you like that. God bless you.